Well, thank you. You joined the Communist Party at the end of your first year at, uh, at Oxford. Yes, in what? summer 1937. Why? Basically, I think, because it was the only party that seemed unequivocally in favour of standing up to Hitler. The Conservative Party was in favour of appeasing him in the main, and the Labour Party was divided between pacifists and a rather vague form of collective security. And uh, I think that's why an enormous number of people you'd never imagine joined at that time. John Biggs Davison, who later became chairman of the Monday Club, two, at least two people I know who later became conservative ministers, and all really for that reason. But this was at a period when the Communist Party was coming out of a deeply sectarian phase, and its policy programme was still entitled for a Soviet Britain. Well, <laughs> I don't think we were very conscious of its domestic policies. The it, watershed in the Communist Party internationally was the Seventh World Congress, which took place, I think, in '35, the year before I went up to Oxford. I went up in the autumn of '36, uh, and... Uh, it was, as you say, very sectarian before that. Uh, communists always wore beards, looked dirty, uh, did badly in their examinations. Uh, then when it became Popular Front, which was essentially the 37 move, which reflected, of course, the desire to create a Popular Front against the Nazis and fascists, um, everybody shaved, um, behaved well in public, and got first in their examinations. And it was uh, totally different, and we were hardly conscious of what it had been before that, because young men of 18, I uh, don't know what the political world was like when they were 14 or 12. Edward Thompson, who I've also spoken to, who joined the party in Cambridge just a few years after you, yes. tells me then most Cambridge communist students had got a photograph of Harry Pollitt on their mantelpiece. Did you have one? No, I never did, no. We had a song was Harry was a Bolshe in one of Lenin la Lenin's lads, but he was slain by counter-revolutionary cads. But uh, there was no hero worship of that time of Harry Pollitt or indeed of the national leadership. As I say, it was overwhelmingly in my particular year, which was the end of the first year of the Spanish Civil War, don't forget, uh, it, was, it was overwhelmingly for international reasons rather than national. How disciplined was the party? Did you have to sell the Daily Worker, for example? No, it wasn't disciplined in that sense at all. And uh, again, the international line of the Communist Party was the popular front against fascism. And, excuse me, yes, um, again, I was a student communist so that uh, we didn't play much part in the work of the Communist Party in Oxford, except uh, during the famous Oxford by-election of 1938, uh, when uh, uh, Sandy Lindsay, who was the master of Balliol, fought uh, Quintin Hogg, later Lord Hailsham, on a popular front programme. Indeed, that, that is the, the most important chapter in the British campaign for a popular front, that Oxford by-election. Yes, I think it probably was, simply because it was the only case where you had a very well-known popular front candidate who couldn't, by any stretch of the imagination, be called a communist. He was a right-wing Labour Party supporter, Lord Lindsay, as he later became. Any embarrassment among Labour supporters, his supporters, about working with communists? No, I don't think there was then, because uh, the trials in Moscow and the suppression of the Kulaks was not really very well known, I would say, among the political class in Britain. <coughs> uh, some intellectuals, like Leonard Wolfe was a notable example, had been fighting a battle for a long time with the fellow travellers like Victor Golanks and John Strachey, uh, uh, who they thought totally misunderstood and misrepresented uh, Soviet communism, but they were a minority, and I think the bulk of us were content simply to be swept along by the tide of anti-fascism. What about the change of party line in the early weeks of the war, when suddenly it went from being people's war against fascism to imperialist war? Any shockwaves that you remember within the party? Oh, yes, there was a tremendous shockwave over the uh, Stalin-Hitler pact, which, of course, preceded the war, and in a sense led to the war. It freed Hitler to... Uh, um, <coughs> mobilise his forces uh, against France and the Low Countries. 
And a lot of people left the Communist Party then. I didn't myself, partly because, <laughs> rather an odd situation, I volunteered for the army the day the war broke out on September the 3rd. And uh, then I was told by a friend in the Communist Party that the line had changed and we decided it was uh, uh, an imperialist war, not an anti-fascist war. And I said, baloney. But, of course, at that time I was waiting to be called into the army and uh, expected to be in the army within a month. In fact, they didn't call us up until the end of that term. They told us we could finish our schools, so it was a whole year after volunteering before I actually joined the army. And I, I left the army, really, I would say, uh, left the Communist Party uh, over the fall of France because I could just understand the Communists... Uh, supporting Russia because Britain and France had been unwilling to make an alliance with Russia against Hitler, which is the way we saw it. But then when it became obvious to a child like me that uh, after the fall of France, Britain would be the next target, not to see this danger seemed to me absolutely ridiculous, and that's when I formally left the party. You've described it as a bed and breakfast organisation, but in fact you stayed for three years, so it's rather more than an overnight stay. No, but that is bed and breakfast in terms of politics. Uh, bed and breakfast in the sense that you join one day and leave the next. Uh, I don't think it's ever happened. But the average length of membership of the Communist Party was two or three years in those days, internationally, not just in Britain. Is there anything that's worth resurrecting from the shambles of the communist experiment? Anything in terms of idealism, comradeship, anything else? Well, I think the idealism and com comradeship was very real, and of course it exists in other parties of all types, Catholic parties too. But I think the world in which the Popular Front became a massive force, after all it formed a government in France under Léon Blum, don't forget, that world has totally disappeared. I think the thing you've got to remember is that the 30s was the period when it seemed as clear to young people that capitalism has failed, as it's clear to young people now that communism has failed. Uh, we'd seen capitalism produce fascism in Italy, uh, Hitler in Germany, a great recession which had pro produced mass unemployment all over the world. And there were very, very f few people in the chattering classes among intellectuals who thought that capitalism had a future at all. And as I say, the failure of capitalism was as evident then as the failure of communism now. Now, it could be people will change their attitude towards communism because uh, in China, for example, where they've gone about things in the opposite way from the Russians, concentrating on introducing bits of the market in, in their economy, it's probably the fastest growing economy in the world, faster even than Japan, but at the cost, as you know, of terrible oppression in the political field. <coughs> I just wonder if you had any anecdotes uh, about your time in the CPGB in Oxford which would give some impression, some flavour of what party activity was like and what it meant to be a communist then. Well, I think the big thing to remember is that the student movement at Oxford was a very lively, happy, humorous movement. It wasn't grimly sectarian. Uh, we used to sing songs about, uh, oh, I'm the man, the very fat man that waters the workers' beer, and, you know, as I crouch beneath the table where the Politburo meets, they would startle from their seats if they knew of half the feats of diversionism and espionage and civil and military sabotage that I perform the whole year round for Hitler. And I always remember a friend of mine who made a parody it was, a, it was Christmas Day on the coal cars, local river in flood. Peasants were sitting on doorsteps, all sunk in depression and mud. It was, as I say, a very outgoing, open movement and appealed to an enormous number of people. I mean, most of the poets at that time were communist, Auden, uh, Spender, Isherwood, or fellow travellers. Louis McNeese was one of the very few who rejected that. Uh, very large number of the painters, the surrealists, oddly enough, although surrealism is as far from communism as you could imagine, and rejected by the Russians, of course, uh, they were nearly all communists. So warm memories on the whole. 
Pardon? Warm memories. Oh, yes, of that period. Yes, I mean, I think I was wrong now, of course. On the other hand, I don't know quite what one could have done otherwise, except worked harder in the Labour Party to change its policy and make it more realistic.